As you know, Irish Studies in Europe is a series of peer-reviewed academic publications in Irish studies. The series is currently edited by Sean Crosson, Hedwig Schwal, and myself, and it aims to publish new research from within the humanities and social sciences on all aspects of the history, society, and culture of Ireland, Northern Ireland, and the Irish diaspora. The program of this series is a deliberate reflection of the objectives of our Federation, the European Federation of Associations and Centers of Irish Studies. Most recently, or to be more precise with the penultimate volume number nine, we have also opened this series for the publication of single author monographs with Daniel Becker's study on the threshold of memory, national history and liminal remembrance in contemporary Irish poetry earlier this year in 2021, obviously. The series is published with WVT, Wissenschaftlicher Vertrag Verlag Trier, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Otto for being the friendliest, most cooperative and efficient publisher any researcher could dream of. All ISE volumes are accessible immediately after publication on the Ephesus website for all Ephesus members, and all volumes are fully open access two years after publication. Of course, we would all be delighted if you'd order hard copies privately or for your university libraries, nevertheless, so even though um, as Ephesus members, you have access um, always online. As you can see, and I will now um, share our website here. So as you can see, our current uh, ISE website is unfortunately not in the best shape and will certainly not win prizes for web design as it is currently. And I could say now that it's the great content of the books that counts and not um, the beautiful online face of the series. Still, while there is certainly some truth to this argument, we are currently working on a completely new and much more attractive website for our Ephesus series, Irish Studies in Europe. So this is something to look forward to. I hope we can get, get it, this launched before the end of 2021. I will not try your patience much longer and um, we will soon delve deeper into volume 10, Stage Irish Performance, Identity, Cultural Circulation. But I mustn't end this welcome note without thanking James Gallagher, our Ephesus coordinator, who has made the volumes and all the content about ISE available on the current website and who has co-organized and is taking care of the technical side of this roundtable discussion tonight. Hedwig Schwal, Sean Crosson, and my sincere thanks also go, of course, to Paul Fagan, Dieter Fuchs, and Tamara Radak for having cooperated and communicated so effectively um, throughout the whole editorial process. It was a real pleasure. And also, thanks for having brought together such a great team of illustrious um, contributors. Thank you, Paul, Dieter, and Tamara, and thanks to all contributors for this absolutely wonderful, timely, and excellently edited Vienna ISE uh, volume, Stage Irish Performance, Identity, Cultural Circulation. I now hand over to you, Paul, and look very much forward to this roundtable discussion. Thank you so much, Katharina, uh, for these uh, wonderful introductory remarks and everything. Uh, I'm just going to open my slides. So thank you once again, Katarina. So it falls to me to introduce the collection's theme and the first speakers of this evening's roundtable. And I'm conscious that we have a rich but packed program tonight, so I will not linger too long. I'll endeavor in my remarks to be more late career Beckett than late career Joyce. However, it would be remiss of me not to take a moment to offer the editor's sincere and heartfelt thanks. First, echoing Katarina's remarks to Werner Huber, to whose memory the collection is dedicated. Second, to the Irish Studies in Europe series editors, Katarina Renhack, 
Hedwig Schwal and Sean Crossan for their guidance throughout the process of the book's production, as well as to Theresa Stampfer for her assistance in preparing the script for production. And third, to the contributors for all their ingenuity, hard work, and good-natured patience throughout the process, particularly as the volume was produced under the inordinately challenging circumstances of the COVID-19 pandemic. So it falls to me to introduce the theme of stage Irish, which is the urban organizing rubric of the book. So perhaps the most enduring characterization of the stage Irishman is provided by Maurice Bourgeois in his 1913 study, John Millington Singh and the Irish Theatre. In his book, Bourgeois defines the stage Irishman thus. The stage Irishman habitually bears the generic name of Pat, Paddy or Teague. He has an atrocious brogue, makes perpetual jokes, blunders and bulls in speaking and never fails to utter by way of some Hibernian seasoning some wild screech or oath of Gaelic origin at every third word. He has an unsurpassable gift of blarney and cadges for tips and free drinks. His hair is of a fiery red, he's rosy cheeked, massive and whiskey loving. His face is one of simian bestiality with an expression of diabolical archness written all over it. He wears a tall felt hat, billycock or wide awake with a cutty clay pipe stuck in front, an open collar shirt, a three caped coat, knee breeches, worsted stockings and cockaded brogue shoes. In his right hand, he brandishes a stout blackthorn or a sprig of shillelagh and threatens to belabor therewith the daring person who will tread on the tails of his coat. For his main characteristics, if there is any such thing as psychology in the stage Irishman, are his swagger, his boisterousness and his pugnacity. He is always ready with a challenge, always anxious to pick a quarrel and peerless for cracking skulls at Donnybrook Fair. So in our editorial introduction, Dieter Fuchs, Tamara Radek and I trace the standard history of, stage, of the stage Irish figure from Spencer, Shakespeare and Johnson up through Swift and Edgeworth's satires, Moore and Owenson's romantic self-representations, Boussacault's 19th century melodramas, the simianized caricatures of punch, the diverse responses to these figurations of the stage Irish in fin de siècle revivalist, nationalist and modernist contexts, John Ford's Irish films, and the stock Irish characters that populated the Saturday morning cartoons I grew up with. Along the way, we encounter a series of increasingly popular and increasingly inept paddies and teagues who appear on the stage under a diversity of striking names. Teague O'Divoli, Captain O'Blunder, Sir Lucius O'Trigger, Dennis Blunder O'Wack, Sally Shamrock, and my personal favorite, Sir Callaghan O'Brallahan. However, the purpose of this volume is not to reaffirm commonplaces about the stage Irish archetype, but rather to revisit them from new theoretical and critical perspectives in order to reevaluate, diversify, and even trouble these critical narratives and histories through a number of interrelated strategies. First, the articles gathered here reevaluate authors and texts that have been decanonized and neglected through an often superficial, dehistoricized evaluation of their stage Irish figures and scenes, including, for instance, William McGinn, Francis Sylvester Mahoney, Charles Lever, Dion Boucicault, and so on. What these chapters discover is that upon closer inspection, such authors' representations of Irishness are often more nuanced, complex, and political than their legacies as purveyors of paddy whackery permit. Secondly, the contributors address the stage Irish figure not solely as the product of a two-way power dynamic between colonizer and colonized, but rather a performance that is constantly shaped and reshaped in a more complex network of performances and gazes transformed through acts of transnational refraction and reception. So this focus entails a more devolved view of the Atlantic archipelago that moves beyond a reductive two-way relation between Ireland and England to consider stage Irish encounters with and performances by Scottish Whigs and Corconian Tories, Derry Catholics and transatlantic tourists, 
alongside the reception and cultural circulation of Irish stereotypes in Vienna, Trieste, Ljubljana, America, and beyond. Thirdly, the chapters reinvestigate the legacy of national hetero stereotypes and auto stereotypes to increasingly inclusive and diverse definitions of Irishness by taking into account their intersections with representations of gender, race, and economic class. This intersectional view helps to move the discussion of stage Irishry beyond previous conceptualizations of national identity as an essentialist category towards a more capacious understanding of Irishness as a fluid discursive construction. The stage Irishman, Maeve Long writes, casts a long shadow. And these chapters find that rather than relics of Ireland's colonial past, the stage Irishman and stage Irish woman retain their power in the 21st century to stereotype and other Irish national identity in ways that can still provoke outrage. Yes, they also preserve a certain vibrant potential for resisting, ridiculing, or renegotiating such contemporary representations through ironic communal humor and sharp-edged political satire. Less a rigid, historicized stereotype of a previous phase of national identity formation, then, stage Irishry remains central to contemporary attempts to perform, negotiate, and deconstruct Irishness before diverse national and international gazes by engaging earnestly or ironically with prevalent myths about Irish selfhood. The Celtic Tiger and Brexit, the marriage equality referendum, and the repeal the eighth and waking the feminist campaigns compel us to return to these histories and representations across media to reassess how these tensions between self-image and othering, innovation and cliche, cultural production and negotiated reception have been shaped and reshaped through cultural, social, historical, and political interfaces between performance, spectatorship, and identity in diverse local and transnational contexts. So this collection aims to provide a sound basis, practical anchors, alternative histories and genealogies, and guiding lights for this ongoing critical conversation by retracing the legacy of the stage Irish trope from new historical, critical, and theoretical perspectives. So before I hand over to the first speaker, I'll just tell you that my own chapter in the book, Groves of Blarney, Fake Songs, Mock Ho Hoaxes, and Stage Irish Identity in William McGinn and Francis Sylvester Mahoney, discusses the relationships between the stage Irish tradition and the Irish literary hoax through the Tory Whig periodical wars between Blackwood's magazine, Fraser's magazine, and the Edinburgh Review in the 1820s and 1830s. So in the chapter, I analyze McGinn's O'Doherty on Irish songs and Mahoney's Father Prout's plea for pilgrimages, both of which forge and then feign to analyze fake Irish songs. I'm interested in the chapter in how this anti-archive of spurious translations of forged originals burlesques the politicized role of translation antiquarianism and Irish Orientalism in the era's re-emergent anxieties over the problem of tracing or constructing the nation's fidelity to its cultural origins in the aftermath of the Acts of Union. In my view, McGinn and Mahoney are particularly relevant to these intersecting histories of stage Irish representation and Irish literary hoaxing as figures who both cast their rivals as stereotypical Irish dissemblers the rival, rivals invariably are Irish nationalists and romanticists, such as Moore and uh, so on. But they also, at the same time as they cast the rivals as stage Irish stereotypes, they also assimilate those same, same stereotypes in their own deceptive mock hoax performances of the cultural signifiers of stage Irishness. McGinn, under the persona of Morgan O'Doherty, Mahoney in his alter ego as Father Prout. With ambivalence, their acts of parodic or creative self-marginalization both exhibit and reject anti-Irish bigotry in slippery, provocative performances of their own hybrid status as both staunch anti-Catholic unionists and fully-fledged stage Irish writers in post-union Ireland and Britain. 
So if you have any questions about McGinn, Mahoney, stage Irish hoaxes and so on, I'd be very happy to address them in the first Q&A session at the end of part one of the roundtable. But before that, we'll have three brief presentations from the first section of the collection, which is titled, What Ish My Nation? Constructing Irishness from Romanticism to Modernism, followed by our first Q&A discussion. So please feel free to drop questions into the chat for any of our first speakers as they occur to you, or simply raise your hand in the discussion. So our first speaker is Marguerite Corporal, who is full professor of Irish literature in transnational contexts at Radberg University. Marguerite is the author of Relocated Memories of the Great Famine in Irish and Diaspora Fiction, 1847 to 70, and the co-editor of A Stage of Emancipation, Change and Progress at the Dublin Gate Theatre, The Great Irish Famine, Visual and Material Culture, and Travelling Irishness in the Long 19th Century. Uh, please help me in welcoming Marguerite. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul, for this uh, wonderful introduction and for your beautiful expose about the introduction and your own contribution as well. Um, my uh, specific contribution to the to the collection is is well focusing on the region um, and to be more precise on the literatures of the region that were very popular um, in the at the end of the 19th century and the early 20th century um, and you can think of writers like Jane Barlow, um, George Moore, um, Frank James Matthew, Charlotte O'Connor Ackles and some of these names may ring a bell with you but others may not now, why do I, did I choose to, to actually contribute a chapter on this? Well, a lot of people tend to think about the region in terms of a lot of, of national identity construction in Ireland, right? That uh, basically these writings of the region were um, well, sort of cementing an idea of Irishness that would also have an important role on a national but also an imperial level. Um, what my contribution um, seeks to do is to actually move beyond the frameworks of the region and the nation to the transnational as well. Um, and I do that by focusing on um, what I regard two important aspects or dimensions of this literature. My chapter is not so much looking at the very interesting story collections and novels themselves, but at two other elements. And one of them is the, the paratextual elements that you find. And what I mean by that are um, introductions, dedications, um, but also illustrations. Um, and the second element that I'm also looking at in my, in my contribution are reviews. And, and what I'm arguing is that if you, if you look very closely at those and also look at the kind of markets and editions in which they are included, um, it tells you about a certain positioning, a very conscious kind of positioning of um, Irish regional character um, across the borders of, of nation, across the Atlantic, but even a wider circle and, and well into continental Europe as well. Um, and the, to talk about the paradoxical elements, um, and to give you maybe a little bit of a teaser, um, for example, we, we have a collection by Jane Barlow, um, stories published before in other editions, but later republished by New York publisher Dodmead & Co called At the Back of Beyond. Um, and she includes um, a topographical note, and I find that a very interesting piece, because here the narrator is taking the readers into the region in Connemara she is actually, well, telling the stories about, um, almost as if she is a tourist guide and, and is actually sort of guiding the readers along to map out the region, to, to really show what the landscape is like and, and what kind of dwellings you will find and things like that. Um, I, I think it tells us a lot about sort of the wider audience that is being imagined. These are readers that have never been to Connemara, for example, that have no idea of what the back of beyond is. Um, but she brings it to the back of beyond, you could say, the more marginal, to, to a very wide kind of centre of readers um, that are actually uh, to be found everywhere. And this, this, this respect also American readers. Um, but you also find it in, in this, this sense of marketing the regional in terms of illustrations. And um, there are beautiful book covers, and Paul had one on, the, on one of the slides of Irish Idols um, just a minute ago. And, and you can see that what a lot of these regional uh, collections did was marketing the region by reference to the soil, by, by literally almost giving a sense of the land and what grows on the land to the readers. 
Um, and interestingly enough, Irish Idols went through several editions and there was also the 1898 holiday edition published again by Dodd, Mead & Co in New York. And it includes beautiful photographs by ethnographer Clifton Johnson, who took out his camera and went to Ireland, went to Connemara to take pictures. Um, and actually they were included in this edition. And I find this interesting that you, you basically see many more of these paratextual elements that, that sort of well map out the region. Um, a, a lot in the American editions, you could actually say. Um, and in my view, it, it probably has to do with the fact that, that, well, these editions try to sort of convey a sense of authenticity to readers unfamiliar with the regions themselves, right? Who, who knew about them maybe from stories of Irish ancestors, but had never traveled there before. Um, but, but get a sense of authenticity of what it's really like to be there um, when you actually look at, uh, at these paratextual elements that play an important role in that. You see a sort of an attention for the paratextual elements that create authenticity as well when you look at the reviews. They're always very central in that. Um, I find it really intriguing too. Sometimes the images matter more than, than the text itself somehow. Um, and the final point I'd like to make that I also think is interesting about my, my contribution is, is well, the sense of network or the generic networks that speaks from reviews. Um, when, when you look at reviews, sometimes they, they really talk already about the emergence of a, a genre that is concerned with, with peasantry or with the local. Um, it's very exciting to read these kind of things. Um, but what is more interesting is that it's not, they're not just discussing Irish writers like Catherine Tynan and Jane Barlow, but they place them in a wider network of writers. Um, and they include, for example, um, um, Thomas Hardy, uh, Quilla Couch, Samuel Rutherford Crockett from Scotland. So you get the sense of well, the British Isles, I think, if you look at a lot of these reviews. Um, it's not in, in this chapter, but meanwhile, I've also seen many connections made to, uh, for example, Mary Wilkins Freeman from America, that you've also seen many comparisons between Irish writers of the region and, and these transnational authors and I think this is interesting too because it, it suggests that the region is marketed in relation to a bigger kind of picture of, of an emerging genre and emerging transnational groups of writers doing exactly the same thing um, but also reaching out I think to international audiences and I think it really gives us a different kind of picture of what staging Irishness might actually mean when you look from the region and you go beyond the nation and you go to the transnational. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Margaret. Um, the, so, the, the chapter offers so much to the book in terms of its like primary objectives, like introducing these new authors to these histories and critical narratives like Jane Barlow and Seamus McManus and Catherine Tynan, Emily Lawless, Frank, James, Matthew, who are so seldom discussed in the context of stage Irishness, but also the idea of cultural circulation. And it's really fascinating how you look at this sort of, the way in which um, paratexts and illustrations construct and market this kind of Irish ecological imaginary across the, and across these uh, transnational borders. And I'm sure there'll be lots of questions about this, but first we're going to move to our second speaker, who is um, Elke Docker, is a professor of English literature at the University of Leuven and director of the Leuven Centre for Irish Studies. She's the author of Irish Women Writers and the Modern Short Story, as well as the co-editor of Irish Women Writers, the Irish Short Story, and Ethel Coburn Main Selected Stories, among other collections. She's the Vice President of Ephesus and the editor of RISE. Thank you very much, Elke. Yes, thank you, Paul, for the introduction and for setting up this uh, roundtable. Um, indeed, in my um, paper, I discussed um, Ethel Colburn Main, a writer whom you've probably not heard of before. Um, she's one of these forgotten women writers um, that have been recovered over the past 20 to 30 years, but Ethel Colburn Main remains forgotten to a large extent. I discovered her work some five to 10 years ago and I'm really very much uh, a fan of her now. And so I take most opportunities to really uh, spread the word about her and to um, make sure that her work is more read and more studied. Um, so, of course, this, this idea of promotion is not the only reason why I wrote about her for this uh, particular um, uh, book or particular topic. Um, also because I think her work um, shows a very interesting way of dealing with ideas of national identity, stereotypes, uh, nationhood and so on. 
Um, partly, of course, um, we can link that to her uh, background. She was an Anglo-Irish writer born in Ireland. Her father was a res resident magist magistrate. So um, part of the so-called Anglo-Irish ascendancy, um, if we still use that word. Um, but she wrote very much from the start from Ireland first and later when she moved to London from London. Um, um, for a London audience, for an English audience, um, even though she continued to write about Ireland as well. Um, so she's, of course, not exceptional in this. There were plenty of writers who, who wrote for um, foreign audiences about Irish identity, about Ireland and so on, and particularly um, used uh, stereotypes, as we, uh, as we all know. Um, but Maine is, I think, very interesting because of the, um, her sustained critique of all these ideas of national identity uh, and also um, the particular way in which she links this uh, this critique of national stereotypes of ideas of um, national identity to questions of gender identity and to gender norms gender stereotypes um, so she really parallels uh, her her critique her deconstruction almost of of these two um, forms of identity um, throughout really her novels and, and short stories. Um, and so it, in, in that sense, I think um, she is unique um, because um, at the time when she started writing the fin de siècle, ideas of womanhood, to, to, to use the gender term, but also of nationhood still held great currency. There were still, uh, even though there, there was a consciousness or an emerging consciousness about the role these, these um, concepts played, they still held um, serious uh, weight. Um, and I think that the way Maine um, introduces and criticizes these ideas in her work, in her stories, um, points forward to much later modernist, but also even postmodernist treatments of these uh, concerns through the attention she focuses on the idea of performance, performing these gender stereotypes, performing these national stereotypes. Um, and you find that, in fact, throughout her stories um, and novels. But the story I focus on for my paper um, is The Happy Day, um, which is a story from 1919. Um, and its plot basically is of an English couple who go on their honeymoon to Ireland. Um, the whole setting of the story is also the, the rise in the Irish tourist industry around the time, and also the way um, Ireland has been very much um, present uh, in London, if you want to, through exactly theatre performances. Not so much of the stage Irishman that uh, Paul described just now, but the um, the plays from the Gaelic revival, like Kathleen e. Hoolian. And so armed with these kind of notions about Ireland, um, of course, they find something very different in Ireland itself. But the story is, I think, more than just a sort of satiric treatment of these stereotypes. Precisely, again, uh, because of the way in which it um, treats these forms of national and gender identity as an aspect of performance and shows the characters th that they're living up to the stereotypes in their behavior. And also because of the way the story is structured, the reader is implicated and judged for his or her stereotypes um, that are brought into the story. Um, yes, so for all of these reasons, I think this is a very interesting story um, and also uh, an interesting writer more generally. Thank you so much, Elke. I mean, I'm such a huge fan of your heroic work on uh, Ethel Colburn, Maine, and I know of insider knowledge that there is another chapter on it coming out quite soon in another collection we're both involved in, as well as the edited stories. And I just think your work is wonderful, and I'm sure a lot of people will, will, will work more on Colburn, Maine. And uh, the way in which you position her at this sort of intersection of national and um, gender identities and discourses and position her as this kind of precursor to kind of the idea of gender and national performativity is really fascinating. So before we get to the Q&A, and I'm sure people have many questions for Elke also, uh, we're coming to our third speaker of part one, after whom we will open the floor to, uh, to questions. So Richard Barlow is an associate professor at Nanyang Technological University, where I believe it's now 20 to 2 in the morning. His articles have appeared in journals such as Irish Studies Review, James Joyce Quarterly, and Scottish Literary Practice. His new book, Modern Irish and Scottish Literature, Connections, Contrasts, Celticisms, is forthcoming with Oxford University Press. Thank you very much, Richard. 
Thanks, Paul. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. So I'll just give you a brief introduction to my chapter um, or article, which is called Dion Busico, Aaron Apog, and Stage Irishry in Finnegan's Wake. Um, so according to Elizabeth Cullingford, um, Dublin-born Dion Busico was the most popular English language playwright in the latter part of the 19th century. Although Irish-themed dramas such as The Colleen Bond from 1860 and Aaron Apogue from 1864 form an important part of his output, Busico's work is often omitted from collected volumes of modern Irish drama, um, which tend to focus on 20th century works. Still, there has been a reconsideration of Busico's work and importance in recent years, particularly in Deirdre McFeely's book, Dion Busico, Irish Identity on Stage. Seamus Dean has also pointed out that although Busico has often been misrepresented as purveying the worst kind of uh, Irish stereotypes, his declared intention was to abolish stage Irishry. And according to Cullingford, English dramatists created the drunken, stupid and violent stage Irishman. The Irish dramatist Dion Busico reinvented him as drunken, clever and charming. In Buzico's Aaron Apog, set during the 1798 rebellion, the rebel Beamish McCool has returned from forced exile in France in order to instigate an insurrection. In addition to its connections with 1798, Aaron Apog has become associated with other significant eras in Irish history, as well as commemorations of historical events. For example, as McFeely explains, the Dublin revival of late uh, 1868 took place amidst an atmosphere of heightened political tension. While Busico was singing the wearing of the green and escaping from prison every night on the London stage, the Fenians were planning a rising for the 20th of September, the anniversary of Robert Emmett's execution for treason in 1803. The part of my article uh, discusses the political context of Busico's plays, but most of it studies Joyce's references and allusions to Busico in, uh, in his work, especially in Finnegan's Wake, where one of the central characters, Sean the Post, is named after a character from Aaron Apog. Book one, chapter three of Finnegan's Wake contains a list of 111 insults directed at the text's central figure, HCE, including the phrase, Right here, I think. Stodge Arsh Man. Um, as John Gordon has noted, Book One, Chapter Three is the Wake's English chapter. Uh, in this chapter of the Wake, the barman HCE is attacked because he is, rather like Bloom in the Cyclops episode of Ulysses, considered not a real Irishman, only a stage Irishman, and one who has suspicious English connections. Like the theatrical stock figure of the stage Irishman, HCE has come to Ireland from abroad. HD is connected with England in the text, among other European countries. Um, elsewhere, as I discuss in my article, HCE is associated with King Mark of Cornwall in a section with Busicodian uh, connections. So in Finnegan's Wake, stage Irishness is inseparable from Englishness and the presence of English culture and power in Ireland. Finnegan's Wake ends, in inverted commas, with a slightly misremembered image from Busico's Aaron Apogue as the river slash mother figure Anna Livia Plurabel or Anna Napog flows out to the sea in the phrase lips or LPS, the keys to given. In Anna Napog it is discussed that the central character Ara once hid an escape plan in her mouth and delivered it to the imprisoned rebel leader Beamish McCool through a kiss. This is why Anna Milish is known as Ara Napog or Ara of the kiss in the play. In Finnegan's Wake, uh, these escape plans become a key. The reference to Aaron Apogue, uh, since it's set in 1798, fits into the theme of risings and uprisings at the close of Finnegan's Wake. Uh, there are a number of references to Easter and to the Easter rising at this point in the text, for example. Um, I mentioned earlier that Joyce took the name of the figure Sean the Post from Aaron Apogue. Uh, since Sean the Post is a postman in the play, as his name suggests, the allusion to Busico at the end of Joyce's text can be read as a link to both 1798 and to 1916, as the character is from a play set during the earlier rising, while his occupation links him to a central location of the latter event, i.e. the Dublin GPO. So stage Irishry in Finnegan's Wake is related to Englishness and the English, 
However, it is also linked in Finnegan's Wake to Ireland's history of armed struggle against British rule. So there's a typically waking duality and ambiguity at work here. I think that as the political resonances of Buzico's plays are revisited, we can revaluate the Dublin playwright's place in Irish literature, stage Irish drama, and in Finnegan's Wake. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Richard. This is, again, such an interesting chapter that provokes so many interesting questions about the relationship between these stage Irish histories and Irish modernism and so on. So if anybody has any questions for the first three speakers, you can put up your hand or you can drop them into the, uh, into the chat. Um, while you're thinking about something, I'll just uh, posit my own question here. So what I find very interesting about the first part of the book is that it takes a series of authors and genres and contexts that are not normally thought of in this sort of stage Irish tradition from the sort of the 1830s conservative wits like McGinn and Mahoney to uh, authors like Barlow and Tynan and so on to Colbert Maine to, um, to Joyce in, as well. And I'm interested in whether any, what have you reflected on what happens to our understanding of these authors when we put them into these contexts. Maybe I'll just ask Richard first, as he spoke most recently. Um, what do you think, normally we think about, you know, Boussacault as this sort of cringy melodrama, melodramatist, and then the revival comes along with its new images of Irish nobility, and then modernism responds to the revival and so on. But what you show so nicely in your chapter is how uh, high, mo high modernists like Joyce and texts like Finnegan's Wake are still really responding to and interested in an author like Boussicot. So I wonder what would happen, what do you think happens if we reevaluate Boussicot and the stage Irish tradition for our understanding of, say, Irish modernism or Joyce's modernism and so on? Mm, that's a very good question. Um, yeah, I think because people like Yeats and uh, Gregory wanted to kind of clear away all that stuff, like the, the sentimental melodrama of Irish revival doesn't mean that people like Joyce weren't reading uh, uh, Boussicault's work or indeed actually attending Boussicault plays, which Joyce himself did. Um, so yeah, I just think um, we don't necessarily have to kind of respond to Boussicault in the way that um, people in the, of the Irish revival did and that we need to put it into a certain political context. Although the other thing to remember is, and I think Deirdre McFeely deals with this very well, is that um, Boussicault wasn't a kind of apolitical, purely sentimental writer. He was actually very politically engaged and written uh, pamphlets about Irish history um, from quite a kind of anti-imperial standpoint. So this kind of needs to be reconsidered. And when you do that, you can see, I mean, in Finnegan's Wake anyway, that um, it's the treatment of Boussico is really bound up with Joyce's um, presentation of Irish history, especially uh, kind of political violence in Irish history. Yeah, and it's so interesting that we don't even, we don't just have to take Boussico in terms of the reception, uh, his reception by the revivalists and modernists, but we don't even have to take the critical uh, narrative about the modernist and revivalist reception as Boussico on faith. Yeah, your chapter is really fascinating for how it opens up some of these discussions. Does anybody have any other questions for our first speakers? Okay, so we have a question from Joseph Brooker in the chat. Joe asks, a question for any all panelists, which I hope isn't premature, but as the revival is being discussed, I'm very interested in how the panelists think that J.M. Singh fits into the history of the stage Irish man, stage Irish woman. There seems to be a double reception in which Singh is seen as reproducing that tradition and as subverting it, depending on whom you ask or what production is involved. So does anyone have any reflections on Singh's position here? So of course, we very consciously in constructing the, the volume avoided these sort of keynotes that, you know, we've avoided the playboy of the Western world and the quiet man and so on, but they're in the background and they're the context in which we're having these discussions. 
Does anyone have a response to Joe about, about Singh? This double reception as reproducing and subversing the stage Irish stereotype. Uh, can I just say one thing? I know I just Please. spoke a minute ago, so I won't take up too much more time, but it just reminds me, I think um, you would know this, Paul, but doesn't Flan O'Brien talk somewhere about um, Singh being like a purveyor of the virus of, of stage Irishry? I yeah, can't remember where that is. That's right. He talks about Flan O'Brien or Miles Nagopoli in one of his yeah. columns talks about the sort of the hyper real effect of Singh's stage Irish characters, where he Singh produces these uh, stage Irish stereotypes, which in Flan O'Brien's opinion are not based in reality, but then have this performative effect where people start are walking around Dublin talking like characters out of uh, out of Singh plays. So yeah, he's interested in this kind of performative. Uh, thing that it, even though, even if it's a cliche that's not anchored in reality, it produces a reality because people start to act and, and, and internalize and act the way in which they see nationhood constructed on stage for him. Um, Flanagan Bryan, of course, a perfect example of what Joe was talking about here, both reproducing and subversing th the tradition of stage Irish representation. I would just say, um, Patrick Kavanagh criticizes sing along similar lines i think actually goes a lot further and and, and veers into fairly naked sectarianism at times where he, he basically says sing sing created a, a version of irishness that uh was acceptable to protestants and enabled enabled protestants to to feel irish um without engaging with any real sense of irishness so yeah just on a on a contemporary note there yes and this is also you know the implicit critique of like Shaw's John Bull's Other Island of the, the sort of the stage representations of the Irish and this type of thing. And in my own chapter, I, I, I'm interested in the Irish hoax and stage Irish traditions, how they intersect for exactly this reason, that, that there's this ability to inhabit, the, take put on the persona and the outward appearance of the stage Irish paddy and buffoon in order to deceive the audience and to subvert it. And McGinn and Mahoney do that, but they're very interesting because they are both, you know, like I say, virulent anti-Catholics, pro-unionist, uh, conservative wits. So there, there's a little even extra interesting wrinkle in the fact that it's them doing it beyond Flann O'Brien and Singh and so on. And it's also very interesting how Singh is now being reevaluated as a modernist like everybody else, it seems. Um, before we move to the next section, I have a, we have a question for Marguerite from Karen. Marguerite, would there be any connection to how the regions were presented in Victorian travel literature? It's such an interesting question. Yeah, I agree. This is a fantastic question, uh, Karin. Um, I really like it. Um, and I would say absolutely yes. Um, um, I think for two reasons. The first one is that we have many traveling characters in, in these, this local color fiction as, well, they appear basically in the text um, and not always in a favorable light, I'm afraid. Um, you basically have the, the travelers from the continent, you have the British travelers, but also a really recurring kind of traveler is somebody who was born in Ireland um, and moved away, went to America, became rich, came back and then feels completely alienated as well from, from what Ireland is. And there's actually a story by George Moore from the Untilled Field called His Magnificence, which is, uh, I think, a great example of this. This is a, a man, um, uh, Tommy Burke, who uh, comes back to his, uh, his hometown, to his home village. Um, and, and well is disgusted by what he sees is the dirt and the poverty of the place but at the same time it's really interesting because this narrative while, while Tommy Burke is sort of looking at the region through all this sort of stereotypical kind of lenses as backward and isolated and a place where, where time has stood still and nothing has changed um, you get the other perspective in the narrative as well. And um, um, basically what I always call sort of the double vision of the, of the regional story that you see a lot, where you get an insider's view of the region and an outsider's view at the same time. 
and here he visits one of his former, uh, he's actually his former um, um, betrothed, who um, he never wrote back to after a long time when he was in America. He comes to her house, she's now married, she's got kids. He really looks down on her, but we get to see her perspective on him as well. And she sort of subverts this idea that the Irish that he feels are sort of ignorant and weak and, and backwards are actually very clever in unmasking, you could say, the arrogance of Tommy Burke um, uh, before he goes back home. Um, and his visit is not a success. I think this is a story which exemplifies exactly what, you, what your question is asking. Um, it, it's, it's basically, you could say, um, um, the double vision of, of the local quality or with the insider vision, writing back to what an outsider perspective would think of the region. So you see this actually happening a lot. Um, and I could go on for ages, but we don't have the time for that. But uh, it, it's really an interesting question. Um, and another thing briefly that I think also these stories respond to are um, how regions are sort of represented in illustrations and text in the illustrated um, press. You see actually a lot of that, for example, in the illustrated London news with specific visions of Connemara. You see these kind of stories also writing back to these kind of representations. So, yeah. Thanks a lot for the question. Yes, and thanks so much for this answer. It was wonderful. Um, before we go to the next section, I just would like to ask Elke a question. Um, so Elke, I mean, uh, of course, as I mentioned just after your talk, one of the most interesting um, elements of your argument about Colburn, Maine is, is this intersection of performative national ident and gender identity. And I wonder if you have any reflections on how this recovery of Irish women writers and the introduction of gender as an intersectional uh, coordinates into these discussions sort of uh, changes the critical histories we're talking about and narratives in the book and where Colbert Maine or her contemporaries fit into this? Yes, that's a, a good question. Um, and I was in fact reminded <laughs> of something when you posed your first question about the, the, the link also to the Gaelic revival and so on, because um, I discovered very recently in um, letters um, Maine wrote to her editors, uh, to her literary agent, sorry, um, in London, um, ha her views about the Gaelic revival, because the editor, uh, sorry, the agents offered to send some of the stories to um, these Gaelic revival magazines, and Maine said, well, they don't want me there. So the, this, this idea very much already at the time that she didn't really seem to fit in any of these traditions. So she, she didn't feel welcome in the Gaelic revival and also showed herself critical of that, of course. Um, she belonged to some extent to the fin de siècle writers because she'd written in the yellow book, uh, but also there um, very soon she, she was um, expressing differences from um, the, the, the main editors and so on there. And also she didn't, she was perhaps or certainly not perceived as being, being a part of the international or even Irish or whatever, even English modernist um, movement. And so by falling in between all of these um, traditions and movements, I think her work was obscured. Um, I think it's important to reinsert her. But then, of course, it's also difficult um, to do so without always looking for allegiances to existing, um, to existing um, movements, which then, of course, only provides one lens um, to her work. So it's, it's, it's a bit tricky with these sort of in-between uh, figures, I would say. And of course, compounded by the fact that she was a woman writer, and of course, um, but that's a more familiar story, perhaps. But also, you make such a fascinating case for Colbert Maine as just this really, really, really interesting author of the period, uh, one who doesn't fit into any clear categorization as an aestheticist, a symbolist, an emergent modernist, uh, and you make such a great case for working on her, I have to say. There's a comment from Lance in the chat, which asks, do you think that melodrama in fiction, drama, or film can carry a latent politicized charge which represents marginal aspects of Irish culture, which is maybe what some of the book's articles address? And I'm going to use my uh, chair's prerogative here to just say, yes, it's in the book, read the book. I really, that's <laughs> all the answers are there. And I also think Richard has already made a great uh, case with this in his discussion of the political components of Boussicault's work and his reference to Deirdre McFeely's work on this and so on. So yeah, I got a laugh at a lance in the chat, so that works perfectly. So that's the end of my part of chairing. I'm gonna hand over to my uh, co-editor, Dieter Fuchs, who's gonna talk about part two of the book, 
which uh, basically is the one which most fully incorporates, I think, the Irish studies in Europe uh, mandate and rubric because it talks about the cultural circulation of Irish stereotypes in uh, the Habsburg Empire, Vienna, Ljubljana, Trieste, and so on. So I'm going to hand over to Dieter and thank uh, my speakers who are all fabulous. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, all right. So as we have to keep an eye on time management, I'm trying to uh, introduce the second part in a very brief manner. And uh, as Paul already mentioned, the second part is entitled Expatriate Perspectives, Staging Irishness in Vienna, Trieste, and Ljubljana. And as you know, all these uh, three cities were part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And uh, I co-edited this part with um, our Ljubljana host of the 2019 conference. And as we also co-organized that conference, uh, we just thought it might be a good idea to bring in a connection between Ljubljana, Vienna, and um, as Trieste is so close uh, to Ljubljana and as it's such an important hotspots uh, in the field of Irish studies dominated by Joy studies, uh, we also uh, decided uh, to uh, bring in this sort of triangular uh, constellation. And uh, the three uh, contributions uh, are by uh, Elisabetta Berme from uh, Trieste, and Elisabetta's contribution is entitled Stage Ascendancy and Charles Lever's Irish Characters. Igor's contribution is on Joyce and it's entitled James Joyce and the Slovenians, Auto and Heterostereotypes. And my contribution is entitled Austria and the Irish Paddy, uh, Sean Casey's Juno and the Paycock staged in 1930 and 1934, Vienna. And to give you a very brief outline, I would like to begin with Elisabetta's article. And Elisabetta's contribution focuses on the lost Victorian Irish novelist, Charles Lever, who lived in Trieste. And uh, he also held the position of British consul there. And residing as an expatriate in what at that time was the major commercial seaport of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Lever, he refashioned the stage Irish cliche of the paddy by applying it to the Hibernian pro-English land owning elites, hence the ascendancy mentioned in the title. So to satirize the English lifestyle of the landed gentry rather than uh, that of uh, the paddy-like uh, of the Irish peasants misrepresented as paddies, Lever's novels feature stage Irishness in terms of stage ascendancy and in addition to uh, the uh, topic addressed in our essay collection, I would also like to mention that Elisabetta's article, of course, is also important in the field of rewriting the traditional literary canon. So I mentioned that Lever is a lost Victorian novelist. And uh, yeah, so he used to be considered a middle brow or even low brow novelist and Elisabetta's contribution brings him back into focus. And I'd like to move on to uh, Igor Mava, our host's chapter uh, on Joyce studies. And his chapter presents an analysis of James Joyce and the Slovenian community in Ljubljana and Trieste. And uh, what I consider uh, important is that, uh, that Igor found out that the cliche of uh, the stage Irishman, the cliche of stage Irishness, uh, it also has a Central European, if not to say Southeastern European counterparts, uh, namely the so-called Eastern Paddy, which of course ties in with uh, the discourse of Orientalism. We could talk about Said a lot in this context. And uh, the important thing is that the Eastern Paddy is located in the Balkan Peninsula, which at that time was uh, entirely colonized by the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So we have the Austro-Hungarian uh, Irish connection with uh, the Balkan Peninsula. And of course, the most uh, 
the most obvious uh, sample of uh, the orientalized Eastern paddy is Leopold Bloom in Ulysses. As you all know, uh, the Bloom family, Bloom's ancestors, before they uh, mm, before they went to Dublin, uh, they lived in Sombathe, a part on the borderline between uh, what nowadays is Austria and um, Hungary. So it's about 120 kilometers from Vienna. So Sambathe um, and then the Bloom family or Virag family moved on to Vienna and Budapest before they finally arrived in Dublin. And this, of course, uh, is an obvious uh, example in how far this cliche of the Eastern Paddy uh, matters. We could also talk about um, anti-Semitic uh, discourse, which absorbed this cliche. And uh, yeah, in addition to that, Igor Mava, he also introduces some uh, rewritings, some Slovenian rewritings of Joyce. And he also introduces a fictional uh, biography of um, a friend Joyce met uh, in uh, Trieste and so on. So again, this is a very rich article. And to move on to my contribution, uh, I would say that my part focuses on Vienna, uh, the metropolis, the former metropolis of the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire. And uh, I do that in order to analyze two stage Austrian character types, which are very similar to uh, stage Irishness, at least at the first glance. And these two stage Austrian character part, uh, types, they may be called uh, the stage Viennese and the stage Tyrolean. And I mentioned uh, that they bear striking similarities at first sight. But if one continues to take a look at this connection, I would say that although uh, the stage Viennese and the stage Tyrolean and the stage Irishman seem to bear striking similarities at first glance, I found it somewhat surprising that this intercultural parallelism, if we may call it this way, either remains unrecognized or what I would argue uh, even uh, is even uh, consciously ignored among Austrian society. So with regard to the critical reception of Irish plays staged in the Austrian capital, uh, Viennese theater reviewers, they fail to understand or even uh, try to consciously ignore uh, this connection. And yet they tend to stress uh, and in order to uh, downplay these connections, they tend, tend to stress the allegedly unbridgeable otherness of Hibernian culture. And uh, this failed cultural transfer, it may be attributed uh, to uh, the following reason. So whereas stage Irishness, of course, is a hetero stereotype inflicted on the Irish by uh, the English law and master as a colonizing technique in order to stress the cultural superiority, uh, the uh, Viennese, uh, the stage Viennese and stage Tyrolean stereotype, it works exactly the other way around. So although these character types are so similar to uh, the stage Irish Paddy, they are not a hetero stereotype, but an auto stereotype. It's a stereotype uh, or it's wishful thinking of uh, the Austrian lower classes. Uh, they have no agency because they are dominated by an all powerful absolutist state apparatus at that time. And so they create uh, the stage Austrian as a subversive figure of self identification in order. So the stage Austrian is a very cunning, slightly anarchic character. And he always finds what's uh, it's still called uh, here in Austria an Austrian solution. So if you, uh, if you, uh, your agency is blocked by the stage apparatus, you find some unconventional semi-legal way uh, to bypass uh, this seemingly all-powerful authority. And so the stage Austrian, it's an auto-stereotype. 
And I would argue that this is one of the main reasons why this failed cultural transfer took place. And another aspect I looked at was uh, the 1934 staging of June and the Paycock. And I decided uh, to look at this theatrical production because um, the first night, there were just some four nights or so, so the first night uh, coincided with the outbreak of the Austrian Civil War uh, when there was a fascist coup d'etat. And of course, the parallelism between the Irish Civil War in June and the Paycock and the situation in Austria when the first night uh, took place, it's quite obvious. And if you look at uh, the reviewers, the contemporary newspaper reviews, uh, one realizes that the reviewers, they really try to do everything in order not even in order to not not even to ignore the all too obvious elephant in the room namely the civil war and uh, i thought this might be um, an interesting example to show uh, how this uh, intercultural transfer uh, was even consciously blocked and so uh, Austrian theater reviews, they always tended to stress the unbridgeable difference between Austrian and Irish culture. Although this stage figures, the stock figures of the stage Irishman and the stage Austrian, they are really, they are so similar uh, that uh, the uh, parallelism basically it cannot be ignored, but uh, they did their best to downplay this connection. And yeah, as I mentioned, we to take a look on uh, time management. So if there are no very pressing questions, I could ask questions to myself. Uh, the colleagues are absent. So I think we also might move on to uh, the third part, which will be introduced by uh, my uh, friend and colleague and co-editor Tamara Radek. Yeah, thanks very much for this, Dieter. Um... Let me just share the table of contents. I thought um, that might be interesting to see, at least for the um, third and, and fourth part. So yeah, um, thank you, Zita, and thank you everyone for coming to this launch. Um, it's really wonderful to see so many people, um, and it's a great pleasure for us to launch this publication um, in virtual space, but with even more of our friends and colleagues um, than we would probably be able to um, see in a room at the present time together. Um, and I'm very glad to have the chance to introduce the third and fourth part of Stage Irish and some of the key themes um, that they cover. And before I start um, with this very short overview, I'd also like to express my sincere gratitude to our contributors, to the series editors, to Paul and Dieter and to Teresa. Um, it's been a pleasure collaborating with you and I'm really grateful for all the work that you put in um, and I'm also very happy that we actually managed to pull off this publication um, despite and during the pandemic, um, which was not always easy for several reasons. So the third section of Stage Irish is titled Popular Paddies, Parading Irishness in the, on the screen and in the streets. And in it, um, the focus lies on, really on performances of Irishness in different ways. So in Hollywood animation of the 1940s and 50s on the one hand, as well as contemporary figurations of it in, in Lisa McGee's Dairy Girls, and in the context of St. Patrick's Day parades on the other. And both um, Michael Conaty and Michelle Witten, who are actually here today and whom I'll introduce in a minute, um, actually used Darby O'Gill and the Little People as one of their examples, um, but read the film in, in different and both of them um, fascinating ways. And yeah, as an editor, it, it's always a particular pleasure to read papers that speak to each other um, in such interesting ways. Um, next, um, Emma Murphy, prop master at the Abbey Theatre, looked at the celebration of St. Patrick's Day as a material marker that's designed to project specific ideas of Irishness, both on a national and an international level. Um, she focuses on the cultural and creative reinvention of the Dublin St. Patrick's Day parade in 1996 as a reflection of an emerging cosmopolitan and also increasingly confident Ireland in the beginnings of the Celtic Tiger era. 
Um, and the final paper in this section is Veronica Membrief, who adds to the critical debate concerning the role of media in the process of renegotiating representations of the troubles by analyzing how Lisa McGee's 2018 sitcom Dairy Girls uses humor and irony to deconstruct stereotyped notions, not only of the very familiar um, Catholic and Protestant populations and divide, but also of other others in the city of Derry. So it's my pleasure to now introduce the first of our two speakers from this section, Michael Connerty. He teaches visual culture and film and animation history at the National Film School in Dublin, and his research interests include early animation and Victorian comics. His monograph, The Comic Strip Arts, Art of Jack B. Yates, has just been published by Palgrave Macmillan. So congratulations on it again, Michael, and yeah, looking forward to your short summary. Thank you to Paul and Dieter and Tamara, of course, for all the, the help uh, and uh, you know, congratulations on getting the, what is a really uh, fascinating collection uh, to this point, but uh, mainly thanks for all the help along the way, folks. Um, so I'll just briefly outline um, the key points of my own chapter, um, which here we are again with this, uh, sort of very, very sort of disturbing uh, Frederick Opera image uh, from the, the late 1890s. There's, there's quite a lot has been written most, most definitively by, by L. Perry Curtis about uh, graphic representations of Ireland and the Irish in the late 19th century in, uh, in the UK in publications like Punch and uh, also in the American context. So here we're looking at a, an image from an American magazine called Puck. Um, so we're, we're all very familiar, I think, with these sort of simianized, uh, sort of brutal images of, of the Irish in, in, uh, in, in the cartoons of this era. Um, what I uh, hoped to do with my research and with my, my paper and now my chapter uh, in the book was to look at how these representations developed in the, the, the graphic culture of the, uh, of the 20th century. So I do touch very briefly, uh, it's something I'd like to expand on at some point, I do touch briefly on the representations of Irish characters in comic strips, which developed out of the, the cartoon and, and caricature um, world of the, of the late 19th century. And this, this is by the same artist as, as the, the previous image. This is a little bit later. Uh, so it's Frederick Opera again with one of the first sort of bona fide cartoon stars of comic strips, uh, Happy Hooligan, um, big star of newspaper strips in America in the early, uh, 20th century and a much more sort of lovable rogue, much more endearing kind of character still has some of the characteristics that we'd, we'd associate with the earlier stuff, uh, the, the kind of protruding, um, simianized jaw and, and so on. Um, but a much more, a much more endearing character. And the, 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 uh, the, the story of, of representations of, of Irish characters in the graphic arts in the 20th century is one that sort of runs in parallel, I suppose, with the, the increasing kind of um, um, acceptance of Irish Americans into um, American, uh, American public life. Um, and uh, I, I'll just start, I, I, I took myself by surprise, I wasn't planning to jump to this image straight away, but it's another, this, this is, I suppose, a, a, Another example of maybe less kind of progressive images of, of the Irish 1939 cartoon from Fleischer Studios, where the Irish are represented as, as uh, hard drinking potatoes. Um, and <laughs> well, this is really a, a sort of an exception in, uh, in relation to the, the kinds of, of cartoons that I wanted to look at. Um, and it's kind of, sort of quite a retrograde image relative to the kinds of image, uh, the, the kind of material that appeared in the output, particularly of famous studios um, in, the, in the, uh, the 1940s and 1950s. 
these, uh, and, and I, I suppose I was looking to, to sort of map out a territory somewhere between the L. Perry Curtis focus on, on the, the caricature tradition and the cartoons on the one hand, and then um, the kind of uh, scholarship that, that exists on, um, on, on Hollywood um, films dealing with Ireland, uh, the, the kind of stuff that's, that was written some time ago by, by Kevin Rocket, Luke Gibbons, uh, and indeed Lance Petit and, and, uh, and Ruth Barton, both of whom I see are, are here. Um, and I think the, these animated cartoons exist somewhere in the, in the, in the middle of that territory. Um, they are, uh, they, they've been somewhat swept under the carpet by, by history. They're, they're short, uh, you know, in the, in the sort of classical uh, Hollywood style, they're short seven minute cartoons that are, are, are sort of rarely seen uh, these days, uh, but which would have, would have had a huge audience at the time and certainly contributed to the kind of touristic uh, discourses and, and the, the sort of conventional representations of Ireland as they evolved. Uh, in, in the wider kind of cinematic universe, um, um, albeit in, 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 in the maybe more sort of, um, sort of direct um, and maybe less nuanced form of the, uh, of the classical Hollywood cartoon. Uh, there's an emphasis on uh, sort of an almost gothic sort of supernatural uh, vision of Ireland in, in, in a number of these cartoons. I'm not talking about a huge number of cartoons, you know, maybe half a dozen in total that were produced around this time, but they all share uh, this kind of fantastical um, element. They all owe a very big debt to, uh, to Disney um, and, the, and the process that's sometimes described as, as Disneyfication, where European folkloric sources are, are sort of absorbed and, and repurposed, um, as in Snow White and the the, the, the Brothers Grimm material that was uh, you know, became the formed the basis of of many of Disney's most successful short cartoons and feature animations. So I'm not looking particularly at material produced by Disney, although uh, I do, as Tamara uh, mentioned, uh, look at at Darby O'Gill. Um, you couldn't really avoid that in in this context. Um, uh, here's Disney in a, a television special, uh, a sort of promotion for, for Darby O'Gill, where he's, he's supposedly in the library in Trinity here. We know that because we've seen uh, a stock shot of, a, of an aeroplane flying through the air, followed by a shot of, of College Green, followed by this shot of, uh, of Disney being shown this big book of, of leprechaun lore. Um, so the influence of Disney and of Snow White is evident in these cartoons uh, produced by famous studios, um, in some cases by animators who had left Disney following the strike um, that happened um, during the, uh, the late 1930s, early 1940s. Uh, this one, uh, I think you can see here that there are elements of the earlier kind of 19th century caricature here, um, but an emphasis on these diminutive you know, fairly cute in the, in the Disney, in the true sort of Disney tradition um, and infantilized um, and much more appealing um, Irish characters, much less, much less brutal. And this is, um, I would suggest, a reflection of the, the, the increasing um, sort of acceptance of, of uh, Irish Americans in, in um, American uh, society at the time. Uh, I'll just run through another couple of examples. You have these quite well-known cartoon characters, um, sort of, you know, visiting Ireland. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of uh, droopy, the dog here, um, purchasing leprechaun hats on, on what is very recognisably O'Connell Street. It's an interesting cartoon because most of the other ones that I, I discuss uh, in the chapter um, focus on this uh, sort of, as I say, faintly kind of gothic and certainly rural vision of Ireland, whereas in the Troopy Leprechaun we get quite a, a sort of um, a modern picture of Ireland with the newly built um, Dublin Airport, um, you know, an example of, sort of international styles, modernist architecture in the background so is quite unusual, certainly relative to the kinds of images that were appearing in in tourist films and travelogues and, and films like The Quiet Man and so on with the emphasis on the rural um, 
another tourist, Casper the Friendly Ghost, visits Ireland because he hears it's full of friendly people. Um, and I talk a little bit about the sort of um, uh, ambivalent nature of the leprechaun character. So they can be friendly and, and cute um, and, and helpful and industrious, or they can be faintly sort of sinister and threatening like these two. The, uh, Porky Pig runs afoul of in uh, in the wearing of the grin. Um, the wearing of the grin also features an incredible uh, sequence, a sort of a Salvador Dali esque um, kind of surrealist vision of of, of Irish signifiers uh, that has to be seen to to be believed. Um, and I briefly touch on. Uh, representations of, of sort of Irish Americans, this, this film in particular, Finnegan's Flea, um, presents a, a, a very sort of dark uh, tale of, of sort of alcoholism and, and ruined dreams in, in the big city and uh, for, for this particular uh, Irish American. Um, so I, I, I attempt to capture, you know, a sort of a range of, um, of, of themes and, and approaches to, to uh, to Irish America, I suppose, in these in these cartoons. Um, okay, that's me done. Great, thanks very much for this. Um, it's always great to see the images once again and mm -hmm. some new ones as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the Dali um, yes. esque painting is a particular favorite, I have to mm -hmm. say. <laughs> Um, yeah, so thanks very much. Um, let's just move on because I'm also looking at the time to to Michelle and then take. Um, questions during the Q and A afterwards, if if you have any questions, um, which I'm sure um, some of you have. Um, so yeah, um, moving on. So the final paper in the section is by Michelle Witten, and I'm glad that I have the opportunity to introduce her today. Um, it's a particular pleasure. So Michelle holds a junior professorship of English and um, Irish literature at the Europa Universität Flensburg. She's the author of James Joyce and Absolute Music from Bloomsbury and co-editor of Shakespeare in Space, Theatrical Explorations of the Spatial Paradigm, James Joyce and the Non-Human and Modernism in Wonderland, Legacies of Lewis Carroll, forthcoming from Bloomsbury. Very much looking forward to that. Thanks very much for your lovely introduction. It's really great to be here. And thank you also to you, Tamara, uh, to Paul and to Dieter for all of your hard work in editing this really fascinating special issue. And um, I know this isn't really conventional, but thank you also to the really generous anonymous peer reviewers of my piece who really gave um, very helpful feedback. I'm really grateful. Um, this, be this piece began as a talk for the Vienna Center for Irish Studies annual summer school on the non-human. Um, I had wanted to talk about the folkloric non-human from and and then suddenly from deep within my childhood, um, Darby O'Gill and Little People called to me. Um, and I'm proud to say that re-watching Darby as an adult, I was no longer frightened by the puka or the banshee or the death coach. Um, instead, I found myself fascinated by the role of King Brian and the role of the good people um, and Disney's choice of what constitutes Irish mythology and also by the significance of the objects in Brian's throne room. Uh, this academic disturbance is kind of the backbone of my piece, um, object lessons and staged Irishness in Darby O'Gill and the Little People. Um, the 1959 film is generally considered to be the gold standard of stage Irishness. And while I do gesture to this by foregrounding stage Irish discourse and the connections to stock characters such as the Fenian and the Paddy, I also read Darby as a problematic stage gale. Um, and I look at how he embodies Irish, uh, the Irish peasant of English caricature uh, with a magical connection to the bodies of ancient idealism, such as the uh, the metonymic leprechaun. I argue that Disney's use of the leprechaun and his creation of what I refer to as stage folklore destabilizes the idea of an independent Ireland by showing Darby O'Gill as being subservient to his Celtic past in the same way that stage Irishness was used as a tool to legitimize Victorian oppression. In fact, Disney's misreading of nationalist objects in the throne room, for example, when interpreted alongside the leprechaun, causes these mythical objects to be sterilized by the very creatures his film seeks to anthologize. So that's a little taster of my piece, and I hope you enjoy reading it. Thanks for your attention. 
really keep um, an eye on the time. <laughs> that's fantastic. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> so much content in so little time. Great. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much. Um, are there any questions um, to our two speakers from this section? Um, I'm just taking a look at chat while you can sort of think about it. Oh, yeah, Lance wrote, writes, um, that's wonderful. Um, still um, relating to, to the images that we saw in, in Michael's um, short um, summary of his paper. And Joseph Brooker writes, fascinating to see these cartoon images of post-war Ireland from Michael's presentation. As always, his work showing such remarkable and unexpected material. Yeah, I'm sure we all agree that the material um, is is really fascinating and um, yeah I think as as both of you show it can be interpreted in so many different ways um, so so we tend to see sort of this stage Irish um, representation everywhere we look um, but yeah as as Michelle's paper also showed um, it's not always sort of there, there is sometimes uh, there are sometimes more layers to to this sort of, sort of superficial um, reading of of in particular Darby Gill as this um, quintessential stage Irishman. Yeah. Yeah, Paul. Sorry that it's me again, but I do have a question for Michelle. I love both Michael's and Michelle's papers in the book. They, as Tamara says, they speak to each other very nicely. One of the things I really like in your chapter, Michelle, is how you reintroduce this idea of animism uh, in these texts. And even as kind of this kind of vitalist force that even though it's put towards these kinds of stage Irishness and disnification of the Irish identity and so on, it has this kind of vital force to move beyond it. There's something in excess of these stereotypes that can't be contained in the kind of animistic, vitalistic vision of the world and so on. So I just wondered if you had anything more to say about that, about what the animistic component of, these, of this text can, uh, can sort of how it could teach us to reread us in a different way. Yeah, definitely. Um, and and I, I focus a lot on the throne room um, in that sense, uh, looking at how what would be emblematic objects um, kind of exist outside of the object itself, like the the harp of Tara or Brian Bruce's sword or the um, the the uh, the cannons that were taken from the Spanish Armada, and how these objects, when taken within this Irish nationalist context, seem to have be imbued with meaning, and yet when read through Disney them being confined into Nakhnashiga actually shows that they're completely inaccessible. And, and so I try to channel the animistic aspect of the Irish revival um, by showing how problematic it is when it's reappropriated in this disnified sense. Thanks very much um, for the question and for the answer as well. Um, okay, we have a couple of questions in the chat. So Hedwig Schwal writes, um, Michael, could you say a bit more of which cartoon producing houses made Irish cartoons? So whether there were only a few, um, and if if Michael Lau was involved, were there any other big names too? And um, sort of the the timeline. So is it between the nineteen thirties and fifties? Um, yeah. Sure. Uh, thanks for that question. I mean that there. Um, most of the ones um, that we we were looking at there were made by famous studios which was uh, which sort of grew out of the Fleischer studios which kind of ran aground uh, in, the, in the early 40s and the Fleischer studios produced um, Betty Boop and uh, Popeye cartoons in the 30s they were the, the, the main competitor Disney's main competitor in the 30s they um, so by the time these cartoons were were being produced, they weren't quite as big an operation, weren't quite as high profile. Um, there's, there's a couple of other big studios represented. So the Droopy cartoon is MGM, who made, who made the, the Tom and Jerry cartoons, uh, for example. Um, Popeye is represented. He meets, uh, he meets a, a leprechaun in a 1961 King Features television cartoon there's a that's sort of a recurring trope where these kind of well-known cartoon characters are um given opportunities to just uh, sort of uh, adopt irish uh, uh, kind of irishness become irish you know so you get to see droopy in the hat or 
uh, Popeye dressed in, in, in a green leprechaun outfit, um, you know, so they get to sort of partake of Irishness in a sort of interesting way. Um, other than Michael Law, the names are Bill, Bill Titla, who did, uh, who did The Wee Man um, and was involved in one of the other cartoons. He had worked on Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, and I think you can see that influence in, in the design of the backgrounds as well as of the of the characters. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's that's it. Mainly, mainly you're talking about famous studios and, and a small number of sort of tier two animators. Great, thanks. Thanks very much for this um, addition. There are two questions about um, Irish American groups and their response to these cartoons and um, also to the question of Irish America. I think for the moment we'll we'll have to sort of postpone this for a bit because um, we still have um, the fourth and final section um, to think about. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you have any any responses, maybe maybe um, we can just get back to that um, at, at the very end. Um, Sorry for rushing on. Um, but I'd like to introduce the last um, section of um, Offstage Irish, which focuses on contemporary political theatre and explores the ways in which Irishness is renegotiated on the 21st century stage. Um, so the topics in this section range from reconfigurations of gender to depictions of the Northern Irish imaginary and representations of the Middle East and other in contemporary Irish theatre. Um, but we actually have all three contributors from this section here, so I'll just let them walk you through their um, contributions. And um, yeah, let, starting with Anne Fogarty. So Anne Fogarty is professor of James Joyce Studies at University College Dublin and founder and co-editor of the Dublin James Joyce Journal. She was associate director of the Yates International Summer School from 1995 to 1997 and has been academic director of the Dublin James Joyce Summer School since 1997, which I'm sure some of us have um, here have attended and enjoyed at some point. She was editor of the Irish University Review from 2002 to 2009 and has written widely on aspects of 20th, 20th century and contemporary Irish writing. She's currently working on a new edition of Dubliners for Penguin, which we're also very much looking forward to. Thank you, Tamara. Um, first, I'd like to um, thank you, um, Tamara, Dieter and Paul, as um, a team of editors and for the, the spirit of cooperation that you always bring um, to every enterprise. I'll keep my summary quite short. My essay focuses on configurations, less stereotypes, but different kinds of configurations and reconfigurations of gender in just a selection of Irish stage adaptations in a 12 month period from 2019 um, to 2020. So pre-COVID uh, up to the first COVID summer. And I treat four plays in my essay, Deirdre Kinnahan's The Unmanageable Sisters, Edna O'Brien's re re revival of The Country Girls, her adaptation of the novel for stage, Marina Carr's version of Hecuba, Euripides Hecuba, and Michael West's version of Solar Bones, the, the, the well-known novel. And I particularly um, look at gender roles, and I'll confine my comments to um, some of my thoughts on two plays, The Unmanageable Sisters by Deirdre Kinahan and Michael West's Solar Bones. Um, but the immediate purpose of my essay, um, apart from looking at the way in which gender is thought about uh, in adaptations, is to open up a critical space in the first instance for adaptations in Irish theatre, because it's a totally neglected topic um, as far as I can see. And the area of adaptation studies, um, as the uh, audience here um, does not need to be told, is a very lively and ever going one um, currently. It used to be much more of a niche concern, um, confined main, mainly to um, film studies and matters such as the adaptations of Shakespeare and film and so on, but it's widened way beyond that. And adaptations certainly are a feature of Irish theatre for many decades. We need a history, I think 
think of adaptations on, on the, the Irish stage, um, but particularly the contemporary stage. And I think it's true also of theatre across the world. Adaptations will make up um, about 50% of productions anywhere. And just looking at theatre in Dublin in uh, 2019, um, people could have gone to a musical of Angela's Ashes and what he does is adaptation of his own novel, The Snapper, uh, an adaptation of Joseph O'Connor's Redemption Falls, and an opera based on Malato um, uh, Uche Okorie's um, This Hostile Life, uh, which was performed in the, the crypt of Christchurch Cathedral. And that's just a, a cross-section of adaptations that were available in, in, in that period. And by and large, there is a gulf um, between the critical status of these literary adaptations on the Irish stage and um, their popularity and success as a phenomenon. Nobody has uh, even map them out or taken stock of them, um, let alone critically uh, engage with them. And I think critics um, are wary of the phenomenon as well. Adaptations are seen as somehow lowbrow, um, a sop to audiences who are never going to read these classics, so kind of classics light um, for wider audiences, and also some kind of sign of a risk averse theatre culture that will put on an adaptation just because of, because of brand recognition. Um, but of course, people within the field of adaptation studies would argue otherwise. And I'll just um, quote some um, ideas um, from Linda Hutchinson, who, uh, Hutchin, who wrote the um, pioneering study um, of adaptations, uh, which she has since revised and which still remains um, foundational. She very winningly argues that an adaptation is a deviation that is not derivative. Um, a work that is second without being secondary, it is its own palimpsestic thing. Um, so she really does sum it up in, an, in, in a nutshell. Uh, adaptations are not um, simply recycling and um, they're not secondary. They're works in their own right and they have a multiple um, aesthetic as well. Um, they don't have just a, a single bunch of features that um, can be identified. And this is true of the two plays that I'll touch on next. Deirdre Kinahan's adaptation of Michel Tremblay's Les Belles Sœurs. Tremblay is a Canadian playwright and his play, uh, which um, came out in 1968, centers on working class uh, life in Montreal and is written in, in, in a local dialect. Kinahan writes her version for a Dublin audience and transposes <coughs> the action um, to Ballymun in the 1970s. And the story of the play, which just takes place in one night, centers on a woman called Jar Lawless, who's had a big win in a kind of local lottery, something that's long since been forgotten now, Green Chill Stamps. She's won a million of these stamps and she has assembled loads of her friends, neighbors, and other associates, all women, to put the stamps in booklets for her. And she fantasizes about what she can purchase from the stamps. It's uh, like a kind of Ikea fantasy, how she'll refurnish, refurbish her house and so on. And um, the play is one of the rare occasions on which working class women's lives were represented on the main Abbey um, stage. And this is something that Kenahan consistently does in her work. Um, Tom Blais plays are remarkable for the fact that they play with the voice. Um, so his play moves between dialogue and naturalistic dialogue between the, the women who bicker and mock each other and their, their friendships, um, but also animosities be between the women and um, a, a, a splitting of the stage into um, soliloquies. The women break away from the group and let us know about their backstory in some kind of way. And then Tremblay also very um, characteristically works with choric voices, chorus of voices within within his plays always feature. Here, of course, these are choruses of, of women. So the women speak in unison often or sing in unison, even though they're not united. Um, so I think what Kinahan does very cleverly in the play um, is to put working class women on stage, but also to uh, work against any kind of romanticization that we might have of heroic working class women um, coming together uh, in some kind of unity, or indeed any kind of um, cliches 
that we are preconceptions we might have about feminist collaboration. These women, in effect, in the end, don't collaborate. They all gradually steal the stamps and smuggle them uh, into their handbags and so on. Um, so Jar Lawless, at the end of the play, um, sees her uh, whole desire to better herself vanish, actually to the, the fact that the sisters don't help her. And Kinahan <coughs> references a phrase that's always attributed to Eamon de Valera in the title of the play, um, The Unmanageable Sisters. Um, de Valera supposedly said, um, like all of the things that de Valera said, I think it's a, apocryphal, he did not say it, um, but that women were um, the best, but most made for the best, but most unmanageable revolutionaries. Uh, Margaret Ward references it her in, in her book without giving it a reference um, on unmanageable revolutionaries. And here, what we see are not unmanageable revolutionaries per se, but unmanageable sisters. Um, so we get a conglomerate of stories that sit uneasily um, alongside each other in this particular play. And the play, um, to the discomfiture of some of the, the critics, ended with the sisters um, singing Oron the Vane, the Irish national anthem, unironically. Um, this was what the critics particularly found difficult, that there was um, a kind of uniting purpose for these women that was political, um, but didn't mean that they shared a cause, nor that they um, particularly shared Irishness, but that they also weren't going to overthrow the system. And the second play, which uh, in a way I kind of added to the first version um, of, of this um, paper originally, which I gave in, in Ljubljana, um, took in Michael West's Solar Bones, a play, the only play as far as I know that actually went on stage in front of a live audience last summer uh, in a very attenuated Kilkenny Arts Festival. And this was Michael West's adaptation of the much celebrated late modernist um, novel by Mike McCormack, Solar Bones, and both the play and the novel um, have the same title. And I think in both works, both um, McCormack's novel and Michael West's play, there's a reconfiguration of um, gender stereotypes, particularly stereotypes and just configurations of masculinity gen generally on the, the Irish stage. Um, in the play, um, Marcus Conway returns um, from um, a, his sudden death and revisits his family home um, on the 2nd of November. So it's All Souls Day and the expectation is that he's somehow a soul in purgatory and that he can be redeemed, that there is a redemption in, in the, the offing. He reviews his life and interestingly, uh, in the stage realization of the um, action and the house is dismantled, um, it's just a building site. Um, whereas uh, in, in, in the novel, um, Conway has built his own house, he's a road engineer, and he's been involved in lots of local projects in Mayo, and is also worried about the environmental damage that he's caused, and is very aware about how structures like houses um, are part of a living universe um, around them, and hence the idea of the, the solar bones. There's also a pandemic reference in, in the play, but a different kind of epidemic, a recurrent one in the West of Ireland, as many of you will know, um, there are big issues around Irish water and the management of water systems in, in Ireland, which are very polluted and get contaminated, um, literally by waste products, human waste products. And this is what happens um, to Conway's wife, and he's beset by these anxieties. Um, the novel was celebrated because it had a lot of modernist elements, it's experimental, um, it makes us privy to Marcus's um, thinking. I'm trying to avoid the uh, very inexact phrase stream of consciousness, but we're made, um, we have access to Conway's reported um, thoughts in the, the novel through uh, uh, blocks of paragraphs of unpunctuated prose. So it's even less punctuated than Molly Bloom's so-called monologue at the end of Ulysses. And I suppose unsurprisingly, this is translated by Michael West into a monologue in, in this play. And the, the monologue um, worked particularly well, just given the claustrophobia of the, the multiple lockdowns in Ireland. There was a brief respite last summer um, for the audience who managed um, to be present. And this man who comes back to 
um, the festering thoughts of his existence. So he thinks back to his life. He has elements of Leopold Bloom, um, who's a very domesticated figure, as we know. But I think even what was born in on me when I um, saw, I wasn't at the, the play itself, but it was filmed for broadcast during the St. Patrick's Day Festival um, this year. It was broadcast worldwide. Um, it, it was uh, particularly sh um, showed a kinship with Molly Bloom's soliloquy, her thoughts at, at the end of um, Ulysses. Um, Conway's ma um, main preoccupations are emotional, a professional and domestic. So he has that full range um, of worries and um, fluctuating thoughts that run through Molly Bloom's head um, at the end of Joyce's um, novel. Um, but ultimately, um, there is no salvation at the end of this play. So the, the, the kind of um, uplift that one might presumed to exist at the end of this soliloquizing monologue, which is very um, humanist as well as experimental, never arrives. And Conway is not a soul in purgatory. And here there are shades of Flanna Brown and Mozart's Don Giovanni as well. Um, he seems to be a soul in torment and um, sort of consigns himself um, to hell at the end. It's a post-secular Irish, uh, Irish novel. The kind of transcendence that Conway discerns in the world is a materialist transcendence, the transcendence of solar bones and engineered works and so on. And I think what um, both the novel and the play, um, West and Mike McCormick be between them. I've, I've no idea whether they actually collaborated or had conversations um, about the adaptation succeed in doing, is redressing and um, tilting in a different direction many of the stereotypes in relation to men on the contemporary Irish um, stage, and particularly that phrase which has become stereotypical in and of itself, the notion of masculinity in crisis, which we link with um, angst-laden um, and usually alcoholic men often prone to violence on the Irish stage um, because there's a harking back to that monologue tradition of Mike Ferguson and other um, such um, playwrights. It's kind of renewed. It brings us back um, to the pre-Celtic Tiger and um, certainly the very much the, the Celtic Tiger um, stage, but now looked at quite differently by this um, character who is rendered in, um, in, in, in differently gendered, I think, between the male and the female um, in, in this play, and who also um, cannot achieve any kind of uh, redemption. McPherson's plays often push characters to, to the brink of some kind of hellish reality. Um, but there is a kind of dawning at the end of, of, of the play uh, where redemption is possible. And in this play, that doesn't happen. And so the adaptation leaves things rest also in the, in the midst, in the context of an audience that is in the middle of a pandemic. At that point, no one knew was going to end. And also within the context of ongoing environmental crisis for which the play makes everyone responsible, Marcus Conway, um, his family, and all of the audience who cross associate with the, the worries of this man who seems to be in purgatory, but is actually in hell. And that might be the position in which we all find ourselves. Thank you. Thanks very much for this. Um, let's just uh, um, end with the with the final two contributors for today. Um, so um, Claire Wallace is Associate Professor at the Department of Anglophone Literatures and Cultures at Charles University, Prague. She's author of The Theatre of David Gregg and Suspect, Suspect Cultures, Narrative Identity and Citation in 1990s New Drama. She's a member of British theatre in the 21st century crisis affect community funded by the Spanish Ministry of Economy and Competitiveness and the European Regional Development Fund. So, yeah, thanks. Thank you. I would like to echo the thanks to the editors for all their patience and hard work on this volume under difficult circumstances. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be included and it's nice to see it come to fruition um, and uh, it's a good end to lockdown, I think. Okay. Um, so in in my paper uh, i consider the frictions between status quo and change with reference to three 
relatively recent uh, theatrical works that offer different images of Northern Ireland. Uh, Stacey Gregg's Shibboleth from 2015, David Ireland's Cypress Avenue from 2016, and Jez Butterworth's The Ferryman 2017, which uh, vividly illustrate, as I describe, some of the intricate and at times counterintuitive ways in which Northern Ireland in the second decade of the 21st century remains an overdetermined site of ambivalent effects and negative attachments in a cultural discourse further complicated now by Brexit. Um, such patterns, of course, are well established uh, as this volume charts. And at the, at, at the opening of my paper, I look to Seamus Heaney's 1975 poem, Act of Union, as a paradigmatic example of the tropes that congeal around the North. In the ensuing decades, the narrative of the North as a dysphoric site of grim tribalism, atavistic violence, paranoia, and perpetual conflict became deeply etched in the cultural and political discourse, so much so that in an essay from 2001, Ronan MacDonald warned that, and I quote, the central danger of all writing about the troubles is the danger of cliché end quote. So it is now more than 20 years since the Good Friday Agreement proposed a new narrative for the North. And in the post-agreement context, the challenges of imagining a cultural space that's not predetermined by political violence and sectarianism while still respecting the legacy and the wounds of the troubles are complex and ongoing. So in my paper, I explore how these three plays, Shibboleth, Cypress Avenue, and The Ferryman, each refract the ambivalences of the effective patterning of the North. All three share a temporal zone in the political penumbras of post-agreement uh, post governance and Brexit. Their production contexts overlap unevenly in several ways, so Shibboleth and Cypress Avenue both opened on the Peacock stage at the Abbey Theatre in Dublin. The Ferryman was produced and Cypress Avenue co-produced by the Royal Court Theatre in London. And both those two plays transferred to highly successful West End and New York runs and have been revived already, um, at least Cypress Avenue. They invite uh, audiences to think and feel in particular ways that I argue are freighted with political implications. So my analysis of their effective textures draws on Berta Heidemann's theorizing of the North, North's negative liminality, Stephanie Lehner's work on transformative aesthetics, performance and memory, and Shan Nagai's reflections on the aesthetics of negative emotions and ugly feelings. And using these frames, I investigate how the uh, tangle of what Nagai calls dysphoric effects uh, that adheres to the North continues to find expression on the stage. In particular, I propose that Nagai's notion of animatedness with its racialized aspect, elucidates a contemporary and troubling politics of powerlessness and agency embedded in these plays and how they reproduce and restructure the tropes associated with a Northern Irish identity and imaginary. And finally, it's not a little ironic that of the three plays, the two with the highest kind of public pro profiles and greeted with the strongest acclaim offer an intoxicating blend of dysphoric effects that arguably reify rather than deconstruct the set pieces of Northern Irish exoticism, violence and extravagant uh, temperamentality. End of story. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, thanks very much for summing up your, your really um, wonderful chapter um, for this collection. Thanks very much. Um, our final speaker today um, is Natasha, Natasha Ramundu. 
Um, she's a lecturer in English at Dari, the, the American College of Greece. Her research interests focus on classical themes in contemporary Irish drama and literature, and she's published on asylum narratives, interculturalism, memory, feminism, and queer rights. She's writing her monograph on Irish literature, classical influences, and human rights, exploring Irish women's writing. And we're very much looking forward um, to your contribution today. And yeah, as always, if you have a couple of questions, just put them in the chat for now or just raise your hand afterwards. So we'll take a couple of minutes for um, the final questions before we wrap up. So, thanks. Thank you very much, Tamara, for this warm introduction. Thank you all for still being here on, on, a, on a Thursday night. Uh, I feel really bad that I have to show you a short PowerPoint. Um, first, I want to thank, um, of course, Tamara, Paul and Dieter for the wonderful work they've done all this time. And um, it's a really a pleasure for me being part of this book. My chapter titled Regarding the Rights of Others, Spectres of the Middle East in Colonel Morrison's Back in Baghdad, uh, I guess, traces uh, the itinerary, as the title suggests, of intersectional uh, reconfigurations of stage Irish uh, out of the complex genealogies of Irish drama that engages specifically with adaptations. Uh, Professor Anne Fogarty talked about this, how important that is, and adaptations of Greek tragedy through the lens of uh, human rights, especially in a post 9 11 context on the contemporary Irish stage as counter-narratives, as I explored in my chapter of um, the legacies of humanism, uh, performing a critique, not just of what it means to uh, stage Irish, but also what it means to stage others on the Irish stage. So it deals a lot with uh, stereotypes of otherness, and uh, it engages, I would say, with an ethico-political discussion um, of what it means to encounter otherness on the Irish stage, as, as well as encountering the self. So um, the back of Baghdad was uh, um, staged almost 15 years ago, 15 years ago, in fact. And uh, I examine this particular play, an adaptation of Euripides' tragedy uh, of the same name, the Bacchae, which premiered the Athens city Dionysia in 405 BC, this time renamed as the Bacchae of Baghdad by Conal Morrison for the Abbey Theatre, the National Theatre of Ireland in 2006, in the context of the contemporary Middle East and the war on terror. Morrison, who also directed the play, inaugurated at the time his role as an Abbey Theatre associate artist and set the story in a very specific uh, context of Iraq's green zone or Little America, as it was called, where the Theban ruler Pentheus represents the American powers and Dionysus, the forces of the East. As the title uh, overly suggests, Morrison makes a very concrete political analogy and purpose that is entirely explicit. It is an anti-war play condemning the invasion uh, of Iraq. And this was something that was accentuated with the intercultural cast as well of the performance, but also with the costumes and the set by Sabine D'Argent which um, offered a snapshot of Baghdad at the time with a half ruined mosque center stage reminiscent of Islamic architecture, modeled also on Saddam Hussein's presidential palace with electricity wires and Western fast food ads hanging over the buildings. And also uh, on, the, on the first slide of my presentation, this is the cover of the program note, which shows an interior of a, of a ruin of the palace. Um, I draw on the work of multiple thinkers uh, and um, public intellectuals at the time who condemned the war. Um, the title of my own paper um, uh, rephrases Susan Sontag's um, uh, iterations in her book regarding the pain of others and her subsequent article for the New York Times regarding the torture of others, where she talks specifically about uh, the visuality, how uh, the, this oracular, or, or rather ocular spectacle of war um, has been documented in war photography. And also I draw on the work of Adriana Cavarero and the uh, concept of horrorism and violence on contemporary theater, tracing, uh, so to speak, the um, uh, reception of the play itself, the Bakhai, in Irish drama, but also the representation of the Middle Eastern other on the contemporary Irish stage. So the, the dynamics of this contested scope of representation that I'm uh, exploring in this chapter uh, is um, 
attempting to dismantle these dominant assumptions about Muslims, Arabs, and the Middle East for Western, often white Christian secular audiences, as in this particular instance with this production, and in Irish theater in particular, at the time of the Celtic Tiger, which is also very crucial. Without neglecting, of course, to consider when we discuss adaptations and the classics, the troubling and conflicting genealogies of cultural imperialism, appropriation and colonization that these, um, these tragedies are enmeshed in. Euripides Bacchae of Bacchae as a classical text, a European Greek text is enmeshed in while originating from what Lindsay Stonebridge calls the, the home of the rights of man. Morrison's The Back of Baghdad further interrogates received notions of ethnic dichotomies between natives and strangers, Greeks, barbarians, friends and enemies, us and them, within the Western tradition. Translated thus for a largely Western European stage and audience, while directly engaging with racial and ethnic others under the white gaze, Morrison's version renegotiates the political subtext and aesthetic tenets of the original play by Euripides, which offers itself for such uh, reconfigurations, taking into account the complexities of identity and power and their role in the Greek tragic convention. Morrison takes up uh, the ambiguities of this legacy in his version of the Bacca in 21st century Ireland in uh, in, I would say I will mention a couple of ways that he does this uh, and that it works. Uh, his version of the tragedy functions as an instantiation of the acts of both speaking for marginal others and listening at the same time to the voices of privilege. By means of this contradistinction, Morrison's Bacca attempts to interrupt the processes of racial and ethnic othering, and in doing so, he destabilizes rather than legitimizes received binaries of self-other established by the Western-driven Orientalist imaginary. I would like just to um, show these pictures here in discussing Adriana Caballero's um, concept of horrorism. Um, and I, I, um, I focus a lot on the visuality, on the visual aspect um, of uh, this production and the dialectical deflection that was uh, uh, very prevalent in the imagery threading Morrison's opaque language on the stage but also uh, on, the, on, the, on his own adaptation that provides a, a direct allusion that predates the scandalous uh, legacy of the controversial Iraq war documents leak otherwise known as the Iraq war logs or torture memos published by WikiLeaks in 2010 and documenting reports of over 150,000 civilian deaths as a result of abuse, torture, rape, and murder by Iraqi police and soldiers classified by US troops as enemy casualties. Looking back at the digital archives of horror, which comprised leaked photographs of Iraqi prisoners tortured by American soldiers in Saddam Hussein's infamous Abu Ghraib prison, it is hard to miss the continuity of the caricature of the Middle Eastern other, concurrently problematizing the symbol of the jihad, turned into terrorist enemy and here into a victim. Pentheus' public edict visually evokes one of the most shocking images from the war, disseminated in mainstream media uh, for the world to see the hooded man. With arms outstretched in an unnervingly Christ-like pose, the photograph of a hooded semi-naked man sprouting wires in Abu Ghraib exposes the systemic horrorism authorized in military torture policies. The unapologetic graphic brutality of these photographs erroneously simulating the Dionysian entrapment and Bacchic mutilation of Pantheo's body in the play replicated a public spectacle and memorial of torture and shame archived in the Western Memory Museum. And in conclusion, I would like to um, talk a bit about the context uh, and how um, this production is important for several reasons in making political, larger political claims that are uh, that remain very timely and unresolved even nowadays. 
um, because it engages in this kind of theatrical praxis uh, of theater as a human rights agent uh, that um, draws attention to the contingent frameworks that shape engagements with migrant others and ethnic minorities living in Ireland today. So in an Irish post-colonial context, I explore how the multiple intersectional discourses and often silences of otherness in Irish theater and culture challenge structural power in a globalized perspective. As such, their reenactment can open up sites of countering a number of human rights issues prevalent in Irish culture and society today. Among these, one of the most inconsistent policies with human rights agendas is the contentious identification of Shannon Airport, Airport as a transatlantic gateway between US and Europe, acting since uh, 2002 as a stopover point in the US government's extraordinary rendition program that was used for the invasions and occupations of both Iraq and Afghanistan. The implication of Ireland in the US-led war on terror led thousands of people, including members of the Irish Kurdish Iraqi community and the anti-war Muslims for Peace and Justice Group to march in Dublin in order to oppose Irish su support for the US invasion of Iraq. In 2014, playwright, activist, and those Dana member, Margareta Darcy, known for protesting, among other, th among other things, for women's rights and civil liberties, uh, was arrested and imprisoned along with Niall Farrell for refusing to sign a bond that put a ban on entering parts of Shannon Airport close to the public and for taking part in the protest over the US military stopovers there. And in conclusion, uh, almost two decades after this production, Morrison's The Back of Baghdad is uh, read or can be read against the experiences of a contemporary structural racism reinforced by social policy directives and legislative measures which claim to integrate new minority communities as Ireland's others. And here I refer specifically to asylum seekers, refugees and migrant women and children. So in this context, the Bakha of Baghdad critiques almost in a prophetic way, a number of systemic rights breaches against both the Irish constitution and the European Convention of Human Rights. Among these are the state's controversial direct provision system operating since 1999 under the auspices of the Reception and Integration Agency and the Department of Justice in Ireland, as well as the landmark 2004 citizenship referendum that contained constitutional legislation to remove, to remove automatic rights to citizenship from children born in Ireland. So these jurisdictive arrangements feature large at the backdrop of this production, but also the increasingly aggressive neoliberal rhetoric undergirding human rights concerns in Irish society today that can be uh, renegotiated in, on the Irish stage. Studied opposite Pinter's Nobel lecture that I uh, explore also in my chapter, following the catastrophe in Iraq and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights drafted in the aftermath of World War I, Morrison's version emphatically alludes to the indivisibility, inviolability, and inalienability of certain collective rights that are fundamentally um, um, inconsistent with the universality of human rights articles. Um, and I talk again about this idea of uh, that Pinter uh, iterates over refracting multiple sides of the storytelling spectrum in order to consider on the Irish stage and in performing Irishness um, what it means to consider or to regard the rights of others as our very own. Thank you very much. Thanks for this um, summary as well. Um, yeah, it, it was really it was really nice to see how also these papers, although they they handle, they tackle different um, different overall themes, still sort of resonated with each other in terms of um, the issue of adaptation, for example, but also issues of affect and also negative affect and, and this political dimension that I think um, we could see throughout, um, throughout these um, three contributions as well. Um, so yeah, are there any questions from the floor? to um to the contributors um i'm just seeing compliments which is also always nice to read um about the papers um great materials um great topics um yeah any further comments or questions 
okay i don't really see any questions and um yeah we're we're already running a bit late um so yeah um let me just um hand over to to Kati for the final closing and thanks so much once again for everyone who contributed um for, to the series editors to everyone who came out today um to everyone who stayed um and yeah it's been a pleasure and um even though we couldn't be in the same room it was still great to see all of you and yeah thanks again yes thank you thanks to all the great contributors as tamara said thanks again to the team of editors uh, you've done a marvelous job um, collecting so many really excellent and, and interesting articles and uh, I've read them, <laughs> obviously, uh, but I'm sure everyone else is now also really curious to delve into the book. And uh, I'm, I'm here and want to reread and um, also analyze the illustrations um, more deeply that luckily and after some discussions and um, uh, queries how we could get them in there, uh, made it into the book and I'm really happy that they did. So thanks again everyone um thanks for also organizing the second ephesus round table and uh, i'd like to take this opportunity last but not least um, to also invite you to our next and third ephesus round table discussion which would take place already in two weeks time on thursday the 14th of october uh, when the irish english research network which has recently joined Ephesus and contributes to um, turning us into a more and more interdisciplinary uh, society, will introduce their exciting work um, to the wider Irish studies community. Um, but thanks again um, to everyone involved in ISE volume 10. Um, thanks again to Werner Hooper to have started that. I'm sure he's been here uh, with us. And uh, I hope to see you soon uh, in any kind of Ephesus context.